So in this video, we're going to cover some of the more social aspects associated with big data and computing. In particular, we're going to talk about bias in terms of computing bias, and we're going to talk also about crowdsourcing, including things like citizen science. We'll start talking about bias first, do a couple of problems on that. So when we talk about bias in APCSP, we're generally talking about what they call computing bias or bias in computing. And this comes in two forms generally. We will see it in big data, but we will also see it when creating algorithms. The specific description provided through the essential knowledge for this class associated with bias is following quote, which is computing innovations can reflect existing human biases because of biases written into the algorithms or biases in data used by the innovation. We're gonna do one problem covering each of those two. The first question is going to be about this algorithm here. And basically we have this algorithm used by this application. And this company wants to use a strategy to introduce some new feature. And it's asking which of the following strategies is the least likely to introduce bias into the application. So basically three of these will have some kind of bias. And the fourth one will be something that doesn't have bias. Let's take a look here. When you have a problem like this about bias, Usually what it wants to see is, it wants to see whether the design of the algorithm is focusing on a specific group of people or whether it's focused on basically an anonymous and distributed or diverse group of people. So let's look at how the first prompt here would exhibit this. So in the first one here, it says that it's providing the updated algorithm for users who use the application at least 10 hours per week, right? So this exhibits bias because we are biasing our algorithm to a specific group of users, specifically these super users who use the application a lot. That would lead to an algorithmic design that focuses too much on people who are really hardcore users or really frequent users, and it doesn't allow us to really design the application to convince other types of users to use it as well, which makes it an inferior application overall. Let's skip to C here. It says to provide the algorithm only to teenage users to generate excitement. But the problem here is if we provide the algorithm only to teenage users, that means that we're only really targeting one group of people. That's of course a very obvious bias. And the feedback we'd get from that is basically that it's only, we're only really hearing back from that small group of people. So this also generates bias. It's not a good way to design this algorithm. And finally, this one's also pretty obvious. It says, if you're testing it with just a small number of users in the city, you're only getting test feedback from a small group of people, and you might not account for issues that people outside the city would encounter in your app. So all of these exhibit bias. In this case, the obvious one here is inviting a random sample of all users to use your new algorithm. In general, that's gonna be the answer to these types of bias questions. Whenever you see something which is like a random sample of everyone, where basically it's an indiscriminate group, it's not picking a particular group, that's gonna be the one that is going to exhibit the least bias. That's the least likely to introduce bias. So this is the correct answer here. Now, normally I wouldn't do two questions on such a niche topic like bias, but this year in particular, 2023, they seem to really be focusing on this topic. So I think it's gonna be good to cover it in a little more depth. So this question, while the previous one was about algorithms, this one's actually more about the data behind the algorithms, which is where most of the descriptions behind bias came from in most curricula. You might've seen the discussion of bias behind something like data sets used for machine learning. In this case, we're gonna have a similar situation here. While this one does talk about updating an algorithm, if you look at all the answers, they all have to do with some kind of data that is used in order to improve the algorithm. And this one, once again, is asking which of these has the least bias. So basically three of these will have some kind of bias and one of them will be uh, the least bias. So all of these are gonna look at some kind of data and make recommendations based on the data. This one here has obvious bias. It's the most frequently played songs is gonna be the data that it uses for recommendations. This is gonna be biased towards songs that are popular. Maybe that's a specific genre, maybe pop songs or some kind of music like that might end up being more popular in general. And not only is it most frequently played, but it's also on the local radio station. So that only is going to account for people who listen to that station. So this has two forms of biases. This one here is also very obvious. It's based on the music taste of the developers of the application. As a developer, I'll tell you that we don't always have very good taste in music. In particular, this is gonna be the musical taste of a bunch of engineers, which is not gonna be a very diverse group of people. It's probably going to be restricted to a smaller set of musical tastes. Even if a lot of those people have different tastes in music, it's just not a very wide group of people. And finally, here's the 1,000 most active users of the application. Clearly, this is going to be biased towards that small group of people. Once again, this group might have a particular set of interests. That's not going to account for people who might not be interested in using the application. So in general, when we see one of these questions on bias, anything that's talking about a specific group of people is probably not gonna be the answer. And of course, once again, 
the answer here happens to be the one that's a random sample of users. So you take a random sample of people who use the application, that's going to be the most likely to be a diverse and unbiased group of people. So here is your answer. Let's do a couple questions about crowdsourcing. So I'm gonna actually do a lot of questions about crowdsourcing because for some reason, of all of the non-math related questions, these are the ones that a lot of people tend to miss. Historically, when I've given this class, I've seen a disproportionate amount of people miss these questions on quizzes. Let's start with this one here. So crowdsourcing in general refers to a concept that we're all probably familiar with. Crowdsourcing is when you have a lot of people involved in the functionality of your program. So for example, the program requires the contribution of many people in order for it to function as intended. The most clear example of this is probably Wikipedia. We're all familiar with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a very much crowdsourced project, and that is because it doesn't rely on a small group of people or on a company. It relies on the input and contribution of pretty much everyone, a large number of people. Now, in this example here, we have some kind of software to help pet owners locate lost pets, so very worthy cause here. And the question is asking which one of these uses crowdsourcing, which best uses crowdsourcing. So let's look at A and B. A and B, neither of these use crowdsourcing because they describe a situation where we have maybe some GPS technology or something, but it's only describing some kind of behavior where the pets, it's talking about the pet's location and it transmits it just to the owner, right? So basically these are interactions that don't really involve anyone but the pet and the owner. They don't involve any kind of crowd. Same with the second one here. This is saying it's going to determine if the pet is within hundred feet of the owner and it'll message the owner when the pet is nearby. Again, it doesn't involve crowds in any way. Let's look at D real quick. So in D, we're getting a little closer. So here we have something which it transmits a message to all users anytime a lost pet is returned to the owner. So that does involve crowds, but that doesn't really help the user in any way. This isn't something where having a crowd actually contributes to the software in a significant way. All right, now let's look at C. In C, what it's gonna do is it's going to upload a photo that is made available to all users of the application and also relative location of where the pet appears to have been lost. So basically, this is going to make this information available to everyone and that's going to help people help the users. So in this way, we can crowdsource the finding of a pet by making sure that a lot of people can look for this pet. So this is clearly one where we are using crowdsourcing to, find, to actually solve a problem. And the reason for that is because we are involving a large number of people to help solve a single problem. All right, now here's a kind of more general question about crowdsourcing. It says, which of these is true about how the internet enables crowdsourcing? So the first one is pretty much, it's a very generic point, which is the internet can provide participants with tools, information, professional knowledge. I mean, that's true, right? It has all sorts of different ways of giving people information so they can help other people. That's kind of just true by default. There's nothing controversial about this statement. And the second one is the more important one, which is the speed and reach of the internet can lower geographic barriers, allowing individuals from different locations to contribute to projects. So this is gonna be a big deal for citizen science as we'll see shortly. But the general idea here is because people from all over the globe can contribute very easily without having to travel to a central location, it makes it so that it's very easy for everyone to provide some input, right? So for Wikipedia, that would come in in the form of, for example, people from all sorts of different countries can contribute articles that might be specific to their region in order to help populate that site. So this is kind of the big reason that crowdsourcing is very useful. Now, the last one here is interesting. This is a very wrong statement, but it makes it almost sound correct, right? It almost tries to sound correct. So it says, using the internet to distribute solutions across many users allows many computational problems to be resolved in reasonable time, even for very large input sizes. And I actually misspoke a little bit there because what it says is it allows all computational problems to be solved. Now, this is actually a point where you need to remember a lesson or two about the section on algorithmic efficiency. If you haven't seen that video, I have a video up on it. And the big point about algorithmic efficiency is that there exist algorithms that cannot be solved in reasonable time or in any time. Those are indecidable problems. And what this basically means is that even if distributing solutions does make it easier to solve some problems, there are still going to be some algorithms that we cannot solve, no matter the input size. And more realistically as well, uh, even for unreasonable time problems that are solvable, some of those problems are gonna grow so big that the population of Earth itself are still not gonna be enough to help. So this is not a correct point right here. This is more on algorithms than on citizen science or crowdsourcing, but nonetheless, an important point to make. So the answer here is gonna be A. So now let's do some stuff on citizen science. So citizen science is a special form of crowdsourcing, and the idea behind citizen science 
is you get a bunch of regular citizens, so not scientists, just normal people, to help solve some kind of problem. Now, the important thing to remember for problems about citizen science is that normal people aren't scientists. They don't know the same kind of stuff as scientists. They might not have the skills or they might not know the methodology and they might not be very good or efficient at individually solving problems. On the other hand, there's a lot of them. There's a ton of these people, right? You have legions of these people, thousands, tens of thousands, millions maybe, and therefore they win by sheer numbers. So while one individual scientist might be better than one citizen scientist, the advantage of citizen science is that we get a ton of these people. So let's look at these problems. So in this problem, we have some kind of motion activated field cameras as described here, and they're going to capture images of animals, right? So we basically have a ton of images and the question is going to ask, what can we do to use citizen science to have a bunch of normal people analyze these images, right? So we're gonna do some image analysis with a whole bunch of citizen scientists. So the question is asking, which of these is a useful way to do this, right? Now remember, when you see a question like this about citizen science, most of the incorrect answers are going to be some form of, oh, the citizen scientists are gonna be better or more accurate at doing this than the actual scientists. Those are gonna be the wrong ones. So let's look at this one here. It says, distributed individuals are likely to be more accurate in wildlife identification than the research team, right? So that's very much incorrect. The research team is gonna be much better at that than the normal citizens on average. But again, we're just gonna have more of these people. So the individuals, the keyword here being by the way, individuals, are definitely not gonna be more accurate. So this is not correct. So let's look at B. Once again here, it's saying the image analysis is going to be more consistent if completed by an individual citizen, right? So once again, it's not about the individual citizen. The individual citizen is not as good at this as the researcher. So look at C. The image analysis is likely to require complex research methods. So if that were the case, they wouldn't be able to rely on regular citizens to do this. So this shows a scenario where we would not be able to use citizen science. So let's look at the actual answer. It says the image analysis is likely to take a longer time for the research team than for distributed groups of individuals. Now that's, that is definitely true. It might be that five researchers will do it much quicker than five individuals, but in this case with citizen science, we might have thousands and thousands of individuals, which makes it so that overall, the overall task of image analysis is probably going to be much faster with the citizen science group. Here, the keyword, by the way, is distributed group. We're not talking about individuals anymore or single people. We are going to talk here about a large number of people who are doing this in parallel. Now here's one more. Let's do one last question on citizen science. And this is a similar thing. It's gonna say, which of these is the best use of citizen science? So as before, we saw that things like specialized knowledge and training, those are not things where citizen science has an advantage, nor is it something that requires expensive equipment. If you need expensive equipment, you can't really provide that to all of the different people that are doing the citizen science. And if everyone has to work in the same laboratory, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? Part of the reason for the citizen science is that all of the participants can be distributed, means working in several different areas. And that shows us kind of the main benefit of citizen science isn't just the numbers, it's also the fact that it's distributed, which means that they're acting from several different locations. So one example of where this is very useful is if you have a bunch of different people in different regions in the earth, they can actually collect, for example, samples of water or samples of earth in different parts of the world without requiring the research team to have to travel around. This is the main benefit of citizen science and just crowdsourcing in general. It's a distributed nature of it.